Good morning, church. It's so good to be with you here on this Facebook Live broadcast. We welcome you, and I just want to know if you are ready for the Word, because I've got a great message from the Word of God for you today. It's a beautiful, great day to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just want to take a moment to thank everyone uh, for joining us here at Fountain of Life on our Facebook Live broadcast, especially those of you who may be watching this for the very first time. We want to welcome you, our internet audience. And uh, if you don't have a church uh, in the Houston area and you live in West Houston, we want to encourage you after this whole crisis is over to, to give us a visit here and check us out. But anyway, we're glad that you're here because this is a glorious day. It's the day when Christians all over the world are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I've always said that the resurrection is like the arch in the very, uh, excuse me, the capstone in the very arch of Christianity. Uh, and so this morning I want to share with you on kind of a strange subject. I want to talk to you today about empty promises. I heard one about two brothers who were getting ready, uh, you know, to die and to boil some eggs to color for Easter. And, uh, you know, boys will be boys. And so the older brother says to the younger brother, he says, you know, I'll give you $10 if you let me crack three of these eggs on your head. And so the younger brother, being a little bit gullible, says, well, you know, do you promise? The older brother says, yes, I promise. And so the young boy, you know, closes his eyes, and with a lot of glee, the, the older brother takes that first raw egg and cracks it on his head, and then takes the second raw egg and cracks it on his head, and, and, and then, you know, the, the little guy's waiting for the third egg to come, and it never comes. And so he says, hey, aren't you going to crack the third egg on my head? And uh, the brother said, nah, if I did that, I'd owe you $10. <laughs> okay, you know, life is full of empty promises like that. And often, it's, if, it sounds, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. In today's world, marketing experts create commercials and advertisements that tell us that we can be happy and sexy and rich or famous if we'll just purchase a certain product. The government promises us that if we support this bill or elect this representative that it will produce, you know, a, 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 a place for us to be healthy and wealthy. And it doesn't take long before we've been fooled time and time again, before we kind of come to know that the world's promises are full of emptiness. And you know, there are some people who wonder if the same thing is true of God. Because you see, our God is a God of promises. In fact, the Bible records that there are over 7,000 promises to God's people. And, but we live in a world full of broken promises and unfulfilled expectations. People make commitments and they don't follow through. People make plans and promises that they never even intended to keep. But I'm going to tell you something. God does not do that. God is different. During the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the Lord gave us something. Instead of prom promises that are full of emptiness... God gave us emptiness that's full of promise. And so this morning, I preach, as I preach this message, I'm preaching to an empty building. I never dreamed that this would become my new normal. But because Jesus is involved in overseeing his church, this is not an empty message preached in an empty building in an empty church, this is a message that has promise, and I'll tell you why. It's God's Word, and God's Word never returns void. And so this morning, I'd like to take a few moments and have us think about the empty promises, the not-so-empty promises of Easter. One of my favorite gospel scriptures is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let me read it for you today. It says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died according to the scriptures. Now I'm certain that most of the people who are listening to this message believe that Jesus died on the cross. But I have good news for you today. The cross is empty. 
Jesus is not hanging on a cross this morning. Beside me, I have an empty cross. It's, it's stained. It's not very beautiful. In fact, it's kind of an ugly cross to tell you the truth. But I want you to know there's, it's, it's a cross that celebrates something. It celebrates that the price has been paid. The empty cross tells us that his work there is done. And so in a moment, I want to talk to you about the promise of the empty cross. That scripture goes on to say that he was buried. And today I have uh, some grave clothes with me. The Bible tells us that they put Jesus in grave clothes, covered his body with spices. But I want you to know that Jesus is no longer buried. But there was something that Jesus left behind in the grave, and that is that was his empty grave clothes. In just a moment, I want to tell you of the promise of the empty grave clothes. And we know that the scripture goes on to tell us, and that he rose again on the third day according to, to the scriptures and we know that the cave or the tomb where Jesus was buried is empty and that empty that empty cave has great spiritual significance for us and so it is the very fact that each of these is empty the empty cross the empty grave clothes and the empty tomb it's because these things are empty that we can be assured that the promises that are found in the word of god are not. So first of all, let's examine the empty cross. Many of us have seen movies that depicted the resurrection, I mean the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And I know that some have enjoyed watching those movies. I'm going to be honest. I really don't like to watch those types of movies because I'll tell you, I love Jesus Christ. And uh, I also know that it was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. And I don't think that I would have liked to have been one of those who sat at the foot of the cross and observed all that went on that day. But the Bible tells us this, that Jesus was hung in an open place. There were many people on that day who saw him hanging there. It was a public execution. And the Bible makes note of some of those people. And this morning I want to talk to you about a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. As we examine the empty cross this morning, all four Gospels record that Mary Magdalene was at the cross. Matthew, Mark, and John even mention her by name. And as Mark describes the crucifixion, he makes this note in Mark chapter 15 and verse number 40. Let me read it. It says, there were also women looking on, in other words, watching the cross from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Lesson of Joseph and Salome. And so we know that this woman, by the name of Mary Magdalene, loved Jesus greatly. She loved him greatly, but not because there was something uh, romantic between him. She loved him because she had found freedom, and she had found forgiveness, and she had found a new future in him. And the Bible notes that this woman from Magdala, a town by the, by the Sea of Galilee, had been set free by Jesus Christ. She had been delivered from demonic possession. Luke chapter 8 and verse 2 actually calls her by name and gives this little footnote. It says, Mary called Magdalene out of whom had come seven demons. Wow. Now, Some have identified her as a very sinful woman. Uh, Tradition has that she was a repentant prostitute whom Jesus had forgiven. We, We really don't know many details of her past life. And the scripture doesn't talk much about that. But we can be assured of one thing, my friend. That this Mary called Magdalene had been involved in sinful things. How she became demonically possessed by seven demons is unknown. But what we do know is that she had been forgiven 
woman, and she had been set free by Jesus Christ. And because of that, she loved Jesus with all of her heart. She even supported his ministry financially. She was at the cross when he was crucified. She was at the tomb when he was buried. And she was there uh, at, the, at, the, at the tomb when, uh, when, when he was resurrected. And, and so this tells us that she was very involved in this time in, in, with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. And I wonder, sometime after the crucifixion, but before the resurrection, I wonder, did Mary return to the empty cross? Maybe she did. You see, Jesus only died once for the sin of humanity. Now, those hours were exceedingly difficult and painful for Jesus. But the penalty was paid by Jesus Christ dying just one time. And I can assure you today that Jesus is not on the cross. If you would have returned to the scene of Jesus Christ's crucifixion, that first resurrection Sunday morning, you may have found relics of his death. You may have found a, a, a braided crown of thorns with uh, stains of blood upon it. A, a horrible thing that was used in mockery of Jesus Christ. You may have found some old rusty nails and certainly you may have found an old cross that was that was stained with the blood of Jesus Christ. It's bizarre, isn't it? The thought that this blood that that stained the old rugged cross is not just any man's blood, but the blood of the sinless son of God. And I can picture Mary standing and looking at an empty cross. Remembering what Jesus had done for her. Remembering the freedom that he had given her. Remembering the forgiveness she had received. Maybe she knew this scripture that's found in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 6. It's a powerful scripture. It says all we. That includes you and me. It includes Mary. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord laid on him. The Lord put on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Maybe shortly after the resurrection, the disciples got together and they would have been discussing this verse. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 5 that tells us this. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we were healed. And so I envision Mary standing at the foot of the cross and, 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 and thinking of all of those things that Jesus had done. And as she saw the crown of thorns, she realized that it was done for her. As she remembered the beating that Jesus Christ had taken at the whipping post, she realized that it was her. As she saw the three rusty nails that were left there, she knew that, he, that it was all for her. And I wonder at what point during that week or shortly after his death, burial, and resurrection did Mary remember and come to a full understanding that it was for Mary's sin that he had to die. And I wonder this morning how many are listening to me on this Facebook Live broadcast or on YouTube who need to think of the cross of Jesus Christ and remember that he died for you and for me. To think that it was those, to think that those nails held your sin to the cross. But that's what they did. You see, it wasn't just Mary Magdalene's sin that was paid for on the cross. It was your sin. And it was my sin. You see, it was sin that led Jesus to the cross. Lies, jealousy, anger, betrayal. And, and not, not the lie of his accusers, not the jealousy of the chief priest, not the anger of the crowd, not, not just the betrayal of Judas, but my friend, it was your sins and my sins, our lies, our jealousy, our anger, our betrayal uh, that put him on the cross. We all have a list of sins, don't we? You know, what sins make your list? Is it anger? Or maybe it's addiction. It could be pride or it could be that you are prejudiced against a group of people. Perhaps it's that you have lustful eyes or a lying tongue or, or, or maybe it's selfishness or sexual promiscuity. My sins may be different from yours, but the truth is each of us has a rather long list. A lifetime sin is enough to rack up some major debt 
in heaven. You yell at your kids out of anger, ka-ching. The debt starts piling up. You covet your friend's car, ka-ching. You envy your neighbor's success, ka-ching. You, you lie, ka-ching. You lose control, ka-ching. You give in to temptation, ka-ching. You doze off during one of my sermons, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. No, I'm just kidding about that. But the truth is, and I'm not kidding about this, that every time we sin, we get further and further in debt to heaven. We figure, uh, you know, at the beginning, we figure that our account balances, uh, as long as our good deeds outnumber our bad deeds. But I want to tell you, that is not the way it works. The Bible tells us this. It tells us that the payment for sin is death. Simply put, it's like this. The cost of your sins is more than you can pay. But I've got some really good news today. Even though the cost of your sins is more than you can pay, the good news is that the grace of God is greater than you can imagine. And do you know what God did with the list of your sins? Listen to what Paul writes. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 13 says this, He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, was stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, it was just as though the list of sins, that charge of legal indebtedness, was nailed to the cross and Jesus paid the price for our sins. He paid the wages for our sins. Amen. That legal charge against you can be dropped today because Jesus became sin and was nailed to the cross. The empty cross, my friend, promises forgiveness. After six hours of agony upon the cross, Jesus spoke these words. He says, it is finished in John 19 and verse number 30. And what makes those, those words so meaningful is that the Greek word translated, it is finished, is the Greek word tetelestai, which is an accounting term that literally means paid in full. Oh, praise God. That's the good news today. When Jesus, Jesus uttered those words, He wiped all the debt racked up by your sin and my sin. He paid the debt that we could never pay. And that, my friend, is why the empty cross has so much promise in it. The empty cross promises forgiveness for all our sins because the price has been paid. All we have to do is come to Him in faith, believing and trusting in His finished work on the cross, accepting Him as our Savior, repenting of our sins, and I'll tell you, he'll, God will impute to us Christ's righteousness. I'll tell you, I've never been one that's been ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. During this coronavirus season, I saw one particular post over and over again. It said this, it said, the greatest thing to fear is not dying with coronavirus, but the greatest thing to fear is dying without Jesus Christ. The United States and the world is in this huge fight against the coronavirus. And I believe that the church of Jesus Christ has a role to play in this fight. And I think that God is using this season to remind us of everything that is precious. Of everything that is really important in our lives. We've been sheltering in our homes and we've been with our families. And some haven't been able to, you know, be touch their kids or their grandkids. And it's been a difficult season. But what has to become most important to you and to me is the spiritual condition of our friends and families. It's time that the church prays like it never has before and it's time that we take the good news of the message of an empty cross to the world because the empty cross tells us the price has been paid hallelujah Jesus died according to the scriptures and there's forgiveness for whoever will believe in him 
Well, some say, well, as soon as I, as I get my life cleaned up, then I'm going to start coming to church. Listen, listen, you don't have to get your life cleaned up before you come. The Scripture says, if so ever will may come, you come just as you are. And you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and He will give you the grace and the strength to help you clean your life up. Amen. Come on, God is good. You don't have to look a certain way, dress a certain way, uh, like a certain certain kind of music the gospel is for whosoever will may come and if you come in faith believing and repenting of your sins you're going to receive that righteousness of Jesus Christ and be right with him let me go to the next part of this message today I want to examine the empty clothes the empty clothes promise us freedom Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were both Pharisees who secretly believed in Jesus. They had been reluctant during Christ's life to really acknowledge Him, but they came, became very courageous at His death. They requested permission from Pilate to bury the body of Jesus. They came to Golgotha bearing burial clothes. Long strips of linen cloth. Pilate supplied permission, Joseph supplied a tomb, and Nicodemus supplied the supplies. John 19 and 40 says this, Then they took the body of Jesus, and they bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now that was on Friday. And one of the most astounding things that happened occurred as they found out the news of Jesus' resurrection. Very early on Sunday morning, Mary burst through the door where the disciples were and delivered the news. Hey, Jesus' body is missing. Mary was urgent both in, with her announcement and instantly Peter and John hurried to the tomb. The Bible tells us that John outran Peter and he arrived first. And, and uh, what he saw as he looked into that tomb so st- Stunned him that he completely stopped. Let me tell you what he saw. John 20 verse 5 tells us what he saw. It says this, And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Let me tell you, those grave clothes have great spiritual significance for us as believers because the promise of the, those empty grave clothes, my friend, is freedom. Now I have with me some beautiful white sheets. They don't really represent what grave clothes would look like. I didn't tear them up for, I didn't want to, you know, ruin those sheets. But as a body decomposes, you can imagine what clean white linen cloths would look like after being wrapped around a dead and decaying body. And I want for, your consider, for you to consider today another Bible event for just a moment as we talk about grave clothes because the New Testament mentions some grave clothes in another place. Jesus had a family that he was especially close to. It was Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And we know from John chapter 11 that Lazarus died and Mary and Martha were grieving. He was wrapped in grave clothes and then he was buried in a tomb. And Jesus came to Mary and Martha's house four days later. His body had already begun decaying. He was four days in the tomb. And, and those of you who know the story remember that Jesus stood outside of that tomb. And the Bible says that Jesus wept. That, that tells us that, that, that if, you, if you lost someone recently or, or even a long time ago, it tells us that Jesus understands with a feeling and, and, and understands that and understand your sorrow. But you see, that day Jesus wanted to declare and through to show who he was. Because he declared that day, I am the resurrection and the life. And so he told those who were there, he said, listen, I want you to move the stone away. And I can imagine Martha and Mary saying, oh no, Jesus, please don't do that. His body smells, it stinks already. It's been four days in the grave. 
But they obeyed the Lord and they moved the stone away. And Jesus stood outside of that grave and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And let me read to you what happened. It says, and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with the cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Can you imagine what that must have been like as Lazarus came bouncing out his body bound in grave clothes now now you would not imagine that anyone dressed in grave grave clothes would continue to live in them Lazarus needed to be set free that's why Jesus said loose him and let him go and uh, can you imagine the joy of that day as they cut away the grave clothes and new garments were provided for Lazarus well, I want you to understand that there's a lot of people in our world today who are in a condition similar to Lazarus. There are a lot of people who've asked for forgiveness. They have, in a sense, come out of the grave. How many of you realize that before we accept Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins? Ephesians 2 and verse 1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And so when we get saved, there's a real sense that we come out of the grave we have new life we've been born again but but there are many people on this resurrection sunday that are a lot like lazarus they have new life but the grave clothes still sink stink cling to them they've never understood the promise of jesus and the empty grave clothes because let me tell you jesus left those grave clothes in the grave hallelujah of course when jesus came out of the grave he didn't need someone to free him because in his life he conquered every sin he never sinned in his life But you see, for those of us who've been saved, those grave clothes represent the old life. They represent the old way of living. They represent addictions. They represent an old way of thinking and sinful habits that want to cling to us. But listen, I want to declare on this Resurrection Sunday, oh, I want to declare to you that Jesus Christ wants to free you from your grave clothes. Amen. There's a powerful verse that today that says this, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Not only did Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection give us forgiveness from sin, but there is a promise in those empty grave clothes. Amen. We have freedom from sin. Those grave clothes smelled like death. Those grave clothes had on them the soil and the wages of sin. But Jesus said to those at Lazarus' grave, loose him and let him go. And I'm here to tell you on this resurrection, this Sunday you don't have to walk around with grave clothes on. I'm telling you that the power of Jesus Christ, the power of His blood, the power of His Spirit, come on, that power of Jesus can set you free. Every stronghold in your life can be broken. Addictions can be broken. Habits can be reformed. Our mind can be renewed and we can be set free. All you have to do is believe believe we believe God for forgiveness at the cross and let me tell you when it comes to the empty grave clothes we can believe God as well that you we can walk in freedom and I'm going to pray at the end of this message that God will send forth a mighty wave of his spirit that will cause freedom to happen for those who believe many years ago in college I memorized the verse of a song and I love it It says he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Come on. The empty grave clothes are a promise of freedom. And finally we come to the empty tomb itself. The tomb in which Jesus was laid to rest belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. It was a newly carved crypt cut into the side of a rock wall. Essentially, a man-made cave with a rock slab and benches on the inside. I'm sure that Joseph's friends pulled him aside. And they said, Joseph, that was such a beautiful, costly, hand-hewed tomb. Why on earth 
Did you give it to someone to be buried in? I can imagine Joseph just standing there smiling and saying, why not? He only needed it for the weekend. <laughs> ah, that conversation probably never took place, but it's true anyhow. Come on. Jesus only needed that tomb for the weekend. Mary and some of Jesus' female father, followers went to the tomb early in the morning. And the Bible tells us that an angel appeared to them and told them these words. He said, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, come and see the place where they lay. And those women were the very first to visit the empty cave. Oh, how many millions have went to Jerusalem to visit that cave. And they went back and they declared that Jesus Christ is indeed alive. Amen. And that good, that's the good news this morning. That this Jesus that you and I serve. Oh, let me tell you, he defeated death. He defeated hell. He defeated the grave. He he bruised Satan's head. He triumphed over him publicly and made a show of him. And I just want to declare today to the world that our Jesus is alive. Coronavirus, no coronavirus, being in church together, that, now that matters. But the truth still remains. Jesus Christ will and shall forever be the living Christ, the one who defeated death. And let me tell you something, my friend, that changes absolutely everything everything because it tells us that if he's alive he can be present with us he's present with those who are struggling in the hospital he's present with those who are in the difficult times of life come on and that means that also his power is available the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead the scripture tells us dwells on the inside of us it tells us that every single promise that he gives is true he still is the healer he still is the he still is the way maker and he is our redeemer and I believe that one day he's going to return on a, whoop, a fluffy white cloud for you and me and we're going to meet him there and when they were the first to visit the cave they went back and declared Jesus is alive the tomb of Jesus remained empty as a symbol of life that outlasts the grave and he's given that it tells us that you and I have life everlasting. In other words, the empty cave promises a future for you and me forever. Our minds can hardly grasp the concept, yet Jesus promised it over and over again. He told Nicodemus in John 3, 16, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have this everlasting life. Wow. He assured the woman at the well in John 4 and verse 14. He said, whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into what? everlasting life. He announced to the crowd in John 6 and verse 47, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Most people today hope for a long and a happy life. But let me tell you something. Jesus offers so much more. He offers forever. He offers eternity. The promise of eternal life is uh, the heartbeat of hope for every believer. It's what we as Christians look for and long for. And I'm here to declare today that the empty tomb serves as a powerful reminder that Christ rose from the grave never to die ever again. And he promises that us that if we believe in in him then we will also live with him forever and here's what I want to say to the church the Lord Jesus Christ on this resurrection day <laughs> doesn't matter how dark the day is it doesn't matter how great the crisis is that our hope will in, 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 in the resurrection of Jesus Christ will never ever be overcome there's an old song that We've sang across the years, and it says these words. It says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. 
Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. Life is worth the living just because he lived. I am sure that the author of those words never imagined a coronavirus epidemic that would shut down economies and cause people to stay in their homes for weeks at a time. But I want you to know those words are so true in this season. Jesus Christ is alive. He's still the King. He still reigns. He's still God. And as we worship Him from our homes, as we praise Him for the resurrection in our living rooms, as we glorify Him on with our families in small little groups. Let me tell you something. The promise is still the same. God holds your future in His hands. And I want you to know that His plans are good. His plans are wonderful. He's alive. And that makes all the difference in the world. I think of singles today being in their homes, starving for human affection. I know It's hard, but this Resurrection Sunday, you are not alone because the living Christ is with you. And I tell you something, He's going to bring us out. We have a future. This empty church that I'm preaching to today, amen, is a church that is full of promise because I believe that God is going to take this crisis and cause there to be an explosion of people coming to Christ as they realize that they need Him. And we've got to pray and believe God for that. But the good news is that Jesus Christ is alive today. And I'm looking forward to the day when we all come back together and can be together and hug one another's necks. All because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The empty cave, the empty empty tomb promises forever to those who put their faith in the one who conquered death. Like I said in the beginning, our God is a God of promises. He always keeps them. The very fact that the cross... And the clothes and the cave are empty. (laughs) Show us that God's promises are not. I'd like to pray with you today. If you need forgiveness today of your sins, I want you to know that the price has been paid. And I'd like to pray with you today that you could accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't know Jesus today, wherever you're at, wherever you're listening, if you need forgiveness, I want you just to repeat this prayer after me. Now, saying a simple prayer, that, 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 that won't save you. But let me tell you, if you say that prayer in faith, it will. So would you just say that prayer in faith, believing? Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I've sinned. I know that my sins were nailed with Jesus Christ on the cross. And Jesus declared that it is paid, that it is finished, that it worked, that, 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 that the price has, has been paid. And Lord, today I trust in what Christ did. And so today I confess my sins to you. And I ask for you to forgive me to come into my life, to wash me, to make me clean. And today, with my mouth, I confess the Lord Jesus Christ. And in my heart, I believe that you, he was risen from the grave. And today, I put my trust in the living Christ. And from this point on in my life, I want to serve Jesus. I want him to be my Lord and my master. I cry out, Jesus, take the wheel. Lord, you drive my life. You show me how to live my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, I want you to please instant message me. And I'd like to get back with you and help you to understand how you can become a strong believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to find a Bible-believing church and get involved in it and uh, grow in the Lord. But maybe today you're here and you're listening to this message and you realize that you've came out of that grave, but yet there's still, there's still grave clothes that cling on to you. And the enemy, your accuser, is constantly telling you, you know, uh, you're just not worthy of the gospel. You, you're not really a believer. You, 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 you aren't any good. Listen, do not believe what the enemy says today, but believe what the Word of God says, because God's Word says He can set you free. I want you right now to cry out to the Lord wherever you're at. 
that. If you need God to set you free right now in your home, in your car, wherever you're listening to this, just lift up your hand and say, in the name of Jesus, I claim the freedom that was given to me by the empty clothes. I'm taking off my grave clothes in the name of Jesus, and I'm putting on that robe of righteousness, and I'm believing God that I can walk free in this world. And we bind every hindrance. We bind every stronghold. We tear it down and we come against every uh, lie of the enemy that's trying to afflict our brothers and sisters in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, we pray for those as well. God, who need an encouragement today about their future. Lord, if you gave us everlasting life, Lord, how much more will you not give us a future here on this planet? So be with us. Provide. Encourage. Put your mighty arms around the people of God today. And Lord, let us know for certain on this Resurrection Sunday that Jesus Christ is truly alive and will give you all praise and all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you today for listening to this Facebook Live broadcast or this YouTube uh, message today. We're honored that you joined us here and took the time to listen. It's been my great privilege to bring the Word of God to you today. We love each and every one of you. We thank God for you. We can hardly wait until we can be back together again. And so we just want to encourage you today to call one another, send a text out, call your mom, call your dad, call your grandpa on this Easter. Don't let this day go by without telling those that you love how important they are. And uh, would you just encourage one another today? And thank you, by the way, for your faithful support of this ministry. And uh, we are depending upon that, and we are grateful for it. We love and thank God for each one of you. God bless you so much.